So um, this the this this side of the sheet, it's just yeah. a summary of uh, what we said in the previous yes. session. So it starts with Plato, it ends with logical positivism. So I'm not going to repeat it. It's just to you know there are many steps, and steps are uh, sort of summarized in this last picture here. Here, the other side. Yeah, yeah, that, that's step by step. Okay. But so, yeah, what exactly is logical, logical positivism? Yes. To define? Um, actually, the best thing actually is to let uh, Wittgenstein himself define it, because you have this quotation on the other on the other side. Great. Basically, this this is um, a paragraph of the philosophical investigation of so his main book. Um, and actually, it contains a quotation of the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, which is his earlier book. And basically, when he wrote his first book in his youth, he was convinced of something which was very close to logical positivism. And then he criticizes it. So actually, the first paragraph is basically a description of the spirit of logical positivism. And then... What is Tractatus? Tractatus is, is a Latin word which means a treaty. It, it's the it's the origin of the word treaty. So at that time, it was fashionable still to to, to use Latin for titles only because the book itself was in German. But uh, for example, you had Russell also with with Principia Mathematica. So this is also Latin, right? So it's just at that time it was fashionable to do this. Um, so his first book that he wrote in the early 1920s was the starting point of logical positivism. And then when he wrote Philosophical Investigation, which was published after his death in 1954, I think. It is after his death. Sorry? It is after his death. Yeah. Actually, uh, he, he had two periods. Basically, one period in which he was very influenced by Bertrand Russell and Cambridge. And then he decided he wanted to stop philosophy for some reason. And he became a teacher in uh, an elementary school. And then, in the 1930s, he came back to Cambridge. And then he started developing his second period philosophy, which is basically... Rejected the previous idea. Yeah, it's why I was wrong, basically. He was trying to explain why the first time he was trying to do something, it was the wrong thing. I think so, same thing I, I, I would like to do. So, my first period should be somewhere uh, in Daita philosophy. Actually, it's something you find uh, quite often in uh, religious characters. You know, they were something in the beginning and then they become something else. For example, in Christianity, Saint Paul was an enemy of the Christians, no, can, uh, and then he became a. Switch off this fan. Oh, sure, of course. Because it is uh, obstructing the flow of hearts. Yes. In, in, in religious journeys, it's very common. In philosophy, less so. Um, actually, in the, in the classical period in Western philosophy. But this kind of, I would say, it's almost a spiritual journey, uh, is actually quite common. As that means they are not well read in the beginning. And, uh... No, basically, basically, it's the problem of youth. Basically, in, when you're young, the only thing you can know is other people have told you things, right? You have no experience. So you tend to believe in a, in a too literal manner in, which, in what we, you have been taught, right? You're, you're too literal in your youth. So you make mistakes because of that. And then experience teaches you otherwise, and then it becomes something else, basically. This uh, long... Uh, um, course yes. has taught us a lesson that no research should be done before one turns 50. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, it depends on what tradition. But for example, in um, in uh, Islamic mysticism, people say that you shouldn't do anything uh, before 40. So there are many there are many uh, ideas like that that you have to first acquire experience before you start really doing some. Uh, um, Sir, spiritual journey. This is in this Sufism. Suggested to the UGC. What about Shankaracharya? No, no, Shankaracharya is 
No, no, but uh, no, uh, my experience is, yeah, she said, yeah, my experience yeah. is uh, now uh, I am exploring, exploring a lot, different uh, different topics, various topics, various things. Then we will get gain knowledge and then we should really do something on our own. No, that uh, yeah. the, 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 all the bogus structures should not be thrown upon the people. If uh, UGC insists upon us to write something, always uh, yearly four papers, Ba basically, this can be assumed to be the error you make in your youth. Platonism is basically the kind of error you make in your youth. Because you have been, learn you have been te uh, learning things. I mean, if you were a good student in school, you have been learning many things. And you tend to believe that they are things like that when you're young. You know, you believe that what you have been taught in class is absolute. Right? Since you have no experience to sort of put that in perspective, you tend to believe in things like that. And so to a certain extent, this is sort of a, an occupational hazard of teaching, basically, and of learning, of course, also. And this is basically what Wittgenstein has experienced himself. Exactly. Uh, should we read this passage? Sure. So thinking is surrounded by a nimbus. Its essence, logic, presents an... Nimbus is like the, the thing you see around the head of saints. You know, like a glowing uh, thing which represents something magical. You know? Aura. Aura. Aura, yeah, or nimbus. Nimbus is the word which is used in art. For example, when you represent saints on the wall of a church, for example, the, the thing around their head is called a nimbus. Yeah, so there's something you find in Western culture and Eastern cultures as well. You, you find it in many, many cultures representing some kind of magical energy which is radiating from a, a character. So its essence, logic, presents an order, namely the a priori order of the world. That is, the order of possibilities which the world and thinking must have in common. But this order, it seems, must be utterly simple. It is prior to all experience, must run through all experience. No empirical cloudiness or uncertainty may attach to it. It must rather be the purest crystal. But this crystal does not appear as an abstraction, but as something concrete. Indeed, as the most concrete, as it were, the hardest thing there is. Right? So basically, this is like a manifesto. Uh, of logical positivism. It says basically that underlying language, which is imperfect, you have something which is perfect, like a crystal, and it is formal logic. Basically, the people believed that you could basically replace language, like apples are sweet, with uh, like formal yeah. representation, like Whatever X, yeah. apple of X means uh, in, in, uh, implication, glucose content superior. The entire world could be represented uh, like this. Like this. So the whole logical positivist, uh, positivist project was to replace language with something like this. And so they really tried to do it. And um, but they. But uh, to me, it occurs that word is not a rectangle to represent like this. Because word is. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. But basically, you can find in the quotation the two levels. Because basically, what he says is that ordinary experience is has empirical cloudiness or uncertainty. So this is exactly what I was trying to represent with yeah, this yeah, yeah. fuzzy thing, great, right? Great. But ah. then you have the purest crystal, and this yeah. is the purest crystal. Yeah. You know, the two levels yeah. of this fuzzy empirical experience and then the, the absolutely perfect concept are both described in this sentence. But instead of saying that uh, these ideas which are perfect exist in some other universe, what he's saying simply is that they are embodied in logic, right? And in logic is not something which exists, it's something which is abstract, but yet it must be basically the structure of the world. Basically he's saying that logic must be the structure of the world. So this understanding... So, uh, this idea was very widely shared because uh, this book in which basically this is the manifesto of what he's going to do, the explanation is goal, uh, 
uh, has been used by the logical positivist movement as a sort of starting point. The Tractatus Logical Philosophicus was basically the sort of uh, vatinicum that every logical positivist was using in the 1920s and 30s. Right? It was considered a starting point. And what the logical positivists did was they were trying actually to do this. So they were publishing, they had a, a journal, and they also had some series of books that they were publishing with a description of a perfect language which would be like this. And they were really trying. They were really trying to say, okay, now, instead of using English in science, we are going to use, at, at least in science, they were still limiting themselves to science. But they were saying that now, people are not going to publish articles written in English. They are going to be written in this kind of language. All right? And the problem they faced, very soon it became apparent, is that each time they were publishing the description of their language, it was longer and longer and longer and longer. Because each time someone was saying, yeah, but you haven't thought of this particular case, you need to have a clause in your language saying that it excludes this particular sub-case or this, okay. So eventually, in order to say, you know, I don't know, the sun is shining, you had to write 10,000 pages. Yes, basically. And the next week, you're going to have to write 100 pages, 100,000 pages etc. So it kept growing and growing and growing and growing and becoming completely unmanageable. So Similar logical... thing has happened in... Uh, in, uh, Not in, in your, uh, in your own, uh, this, is, this is what happens... I mean, I mean, today in Bangalore... Today in Bangalore, maybe 100,000 people are facing exactly this problem. They are software engineers who are trying to write specifications for their projects. Okay? And each time they go to the users, they realize that something is missing. So the specifications becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, the one important thing was not in the specification. They forgot it. It's always like this. If you try to formalize something, this inflation problem happens. And still, what is important will be forgotten. So there are, there are, I think, very deep philosophical reasons for that, and we may discuss it later on. But at the moment, the problem that the, the guys were facing with logical positivism is still being faced today, every day, in every bank, insurance company, every kind of company where you try to specify a formal IT system, because it's basically the same kind of project that the logical positivists were doing. Right, so what, what Wittgenstein says in his later period about what he was thinking, he says, we are under the illusion that what is peculiar, profound, and essential in, uh, to us in our uh, investigation resides in its trying to grasp the incomparable essence of language. That is, the order existing between the concept of proposition, word, inference, truth, experience, and so forth. This order is a super order between, so to speak, super concepts. Whereas, in fact, if the words language, experience, world have a use, it must be as humble as one, uh, as, one as that of the world, of the words uh, table, lamp, door, etc. So basically, basically what he's, what he's saying basically is that um, logical positivism is a superstition. He's, he's exactly saying that. This is why he uses the word super. All right? Superstition is a belief in the supernatural. And basically he's saying that this pure crystal that the logical positivists believe in is like a ghost or uh, a god, something which is supernatural and in fact doesn't exist. He was saying that basically that in my youth, I was believing in this magic, that there was some underlying uh, thing uh, of logic below language, and this is basically a superstition. It doesn't exist. And, uh, and uh, basically, he's, he's, he's not saying it as such. He's not using the word superstition. He's a naturalist. He's a very... He believes in nature, whatever we experience in the Yeah, actually, he is believed... I mean... Imperialist. He is... How can I say? How can I say that? He's, he's, um, he's living in a period where nobody believes in the supernatural anymore. Okay? In, in Cambridge, in the 19... 
in the early 19th century, nobody was, was believing in anything other than science already. Western culture had reached the point where basically the belief in the supernatural was entirely and completely dead. So he doesn't even take the, the step to really say it because it's obvious. Everybody around him, the people who, who, to whom he's talking, basically do not believe in the supernatural in any form. It's a given, basically. Nobody believes in this anymore. And actually, the, the logical positivists do not believe in the supernatural either, right? The logical positivists are scientists, and himself, he was trained as an engineer, and he went to Cambridge to do philosophy, and he thought he was doing science, you know? But in fact, he's saying, I was humbled by my own mistake, because in fact, even though I thought I didn't believe in the supernatural, I was creating another kind of supernatural in a different way. And basically, he's saying that if you, if you do not want to fall into the trap of the supernatural, the only thing you can do is use ordinary language. Because basically, that's, that's what makes his method sometimes difficult to grasp. It's that he purposefully refuses every technical terms, every item of technical vocabulary. Because he says that basically, Philosophy must be what you do before you do anything else. It's prior to anything, right? So at that point, you have not yet defined your technical vocabulary. If you start defining in your vocabulary, it means you're already starting to do something. It's basically, you're not doing philosophy anymore. You're doing psychology, you're doing uh, history, you're doing uh, physics, whatever, but you're no longer doing philosophy. If you're defining a, a technical vocabulary, it's, it's no longer prior to doing something. He has, a, he has an image for this. He's saying that basically, ordinary language is like uh, an old city. Okay, we have this in Bangalore, very near, you know, the care market area. Initially, it was inside walls, and inside, the streets are like this. Any, any city in the middle, if it's old enough, you will have a, a district which is like that. It's the same in London, it's the same in Paris, everywhere. And then, you start to build extensions. With straight lines. With straight lines. And basically, he's saying that natural language is this. It's old city. Yes, old city. It grew like organic. And then, when you start doing science and you invent some technical vocabulary, for example, physics, it will look like this. Basically, you're extending language. So the extension, this is just an extension of natural language. Yes. Not the exact... Uh, you cannot, you cannot, the, the idea that somehow logic underlies natural language, you say, this is superstition. This is, this is a belief which is widely shared, but it's not like that. What he's saying is that, in fact, you, you can use, you can build mathematical logic, for example, as an extension of language, no problem, right? If you consider language as Chamrachpet, you know, like a, a district which is uh, like new, like this, de deliberate, you can use it as an extension in certain cases. Like, for example, in computer science, you can use logic, no problem. But if you think that this is sort of underlying this in a sort of magical way, in a sort of hidden way, this is, this is untrue. This is misleading. This is illusion. And that's in, he uses the word illusion. Yes, we is. are under the illusion that. The, that, that is, the order existing between the concepts of opposition, word influence, truth experience, and so forth. Basically, what he's saying is that all these words, mm. they live here. Mm. The words we use to talk mm. together, and the, the reason why we understand each other, is because they are here. Because if we are not physicists, we don't understand this. If we are not logicians, we don't understand this. But everybody understands this. This is the common, uh, the common good that we have together. And if we are so, doing, uh, I think my, thing, my, my, my thesis is all about this. My thesis is all about this. 
Basically, what, what, what he's saying is that this kind of uh, language is useful in a very specific context. For example, this, uh, if this is logic, logic is useful because it can be executed by a machine, right? whereas ordinary language cannot. So if you want to write programs that a machine can understand, you have to write them here and you cannot write them here. But in order to speak in everyday situations, this is completely useless. You cannot speak like that. Because the purpose of language in everyday situation is not the same as what we want to do here. And the, what Wittgenstein is trying to explain is what is the purpose of... I think of this theory uh, so helps us to understand the, the, the other critical uh, the natural languages, other than natural languages. Languages are, are helping just to extend the natural language yes. rather than creating another world. Yes, yes. It's, it's not underlying uh, natural language, it's just something else we add to it. And it has connection. For example, uh, certain words you use like at the border because they, they have a meaning here and they also have a meaning here which may be different. But you use the same words because it will help you remember what they mean, basically. In mathematics it's always like that. You reuse many words from ordinary language, but you will use them. As far as I know, from uh, get to what we are, we are discussing. Uh, par partially, okay. what I'm saying, I'm, you, I heard you mention Chomsky, which I, I know quite well. I think Chomsky is like that. Because Chomsky thinks that generative grammar are something like this, you know. They, he thinks that his generative grammars are something which is underlying, underlying language. language. Yeah. So what is interesting is that actually you can you can write another arrow here for Chomsky. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's again a Platonist, and it shows that even Chomsky though Wittgen is, is a Platonist, yeah. because he thinks that generative grammars are here. They're built in some some rules are. Yeah, he, yeah, like the pineal gland of uh, Descartes. Uh, he thinks that his generative grammars are actually that, underlying language. He said, language. No, except, he said the, there, is a, there is a language. No, there's underlying a language. Principle language. Language. I have to switch on the yes. uh, thing. But he says that is not uh, something unnatural or. Uh, again, you are a believer of that Platonian state. That's all. No, no, not, not believing in the. He says the people have the natural capacity to. Get but the with, what sort of, whether this is the model or what, that's our question. Actually, uh, Chomsky is not a neuroscientist. He is a linguist. And therefore, if he says that this is a generative grammar, or generative grammar are here, if, he not an, if he's not a neuroscientist, then it's a superstition. Because the only... His argument is very strong. Yeah, because the only way to... The, the only way... From what Pramana is giving? What evidence is giving? No, no, no. He says humans have the capacity. That's all. But, but that capacity is not in this is form. Is if, if, from, uh, if he wants to say that, he needs to be a neuroscientist. Because he does as soon as. He needs to be a neuroscientist. He needs to. Because if he says that, then it's a theory of the brain. So the next step is to take someone, wire his brain, and start to look for this thing. You know, if you're a scientist and you propose a theory, immediately what you need to do is an experiment. So if you're a neuroscientist and you say, okay, in the, you know, electroencephalogram, I will find these things, then okay, it's science. It's a theory and it's, it's provable or disprovable by experiment. But he's not doing that. And uh, um, Wittgenstein says that in that case, it's, he's building a superstition. These are some, what is called, axioms. There are some for Chomsky. I mean, the problem with Chomsky is that he's not formulating it as a scientific theory. He's formulating it as a superstition. Yes. He's saying it is like this. It is like this. You cannot do that. If you want to do that, then you have to look for yes. it. You have to find it experimentally. That's what. That is not basic. done in Chomsky. Yes. And basically, Wittgenstein would say that basically. The reason why Chomsky thought that, and the reason why Chomsky was successful, is that this lower part is actually attractive. People want to be Platonists. And the reason is that they are university professors. They are teachers. And so a teacher likes to believe in what he's teaching. 
and teacher would like to create another world for uh, for exactly. another world for the exactly. students rather exactly. than living in the uh, in the real world. Yeah. 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 So so basically this this basically we are not there. We should we should be here because you are not just the system and there for natural. Abhachar is naturalist man. So he never believes in the some uh, superstition ideas like in the okra. Abhachar is here actually between sense place. He is so natural. Under so natural empirical empirical system. Empirical system is come other. All Vedanta is sir here. No 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 no. Let on it. Shiva no no. Shankara is in front of the side. Abhachar is in between sense place. What is that? Yes yes. You you should be in between sense place. Okay. So um, the problem precisely is that this is not entirely an intellectual mistake. This is actually a spiritual and even um, spiritual mistake, and or even worse than that, it's a vice. Basically, what Wittgenstein is saying, if you read between the lines, is that the attraction that we feel for this is like a vice, is like alcohol. It's something which entraps us, and we need to be cured of it. He uses this medical metaphor to explain that this is not only a purely intellectual problem, it's actually um, a moral bad habit problem. Philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intellect by means of language. And then it's even clearer, the treatment of a philosophical question is like the treatment of an illness. Basically, what he's saying is that most of philosophy is actually superstition or mental illness. He's saying that as we do philosophy, he say when our mind is idling, you know, like an engine is just idling. This is what we are doing when we're doing philosophy. We're not actually doing something or just... Our brain is just uh, running uh, without doing anything. And when we do this, we will catch certain illnesses. The, this is a dangerous thing to do, to let your mind idle, because it will allow certain demons to bewitch you. Right? Basically, this is interesting, these two sentences, because this is formulated in, um, in a past worldview, in an ancient worldview even, and this is formulated in a modern worldview. In the past, people thought that, you know, uh, I mean, it, at least in Middle Eastern and e European tradition, that mental illness was called by demons, all right? Bewitchment, bewitchment is when a demon comes into your head and makes you crazy, all right? This is a very old idea. It, it existed in Mesopotamia long, long time before even Christianity. And the modern worldview is that it's illness, medical. We have gone from supernatural to medical. But in these two sentences, actually, he's saying the same thing. It is he's the same sentence uttered by the Wittgenstein. Yeah, yeah. These are both in philosophical investigations. as They are very famous. I mean, if you hear about Wittgenstein, you will both uh, see these quotations all the time because they, 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 are really, they go to the heart of what he's trying to do. Basically, he's trying to, to say um, uh, someone who is bewitched by a vision like this needs not an intellectual explanation, but like a chiropractor. Someone who is going to take your brain and and sort of massage it until you get rid of this wrong idea. <laughs> so... This, this is too much actually. This is too much reaction towards... Uh, this is a really harsh reaction towards... Uh, unrealistic. unrealistic. Not harsh. Maybe harsh, but... Uh, Basically, what he's saying is that this problem shows that there is, a, there is a deep thing that we cannot get rid of. It's, it's basically, this, is, this looks like reincarnation. Since you are uh, in the grip of uh, illusion, maya, you keep reincarnating. And what, what Wittgenstein is teaching is moksha. He's saying, okay, I'm going to teach you... Be free. Yeah, I'm going to teach you a yoga if you want, and if you practice this yoga, you will be freed from this cycle. It's very close to the idea of moksha. Uh, the idea of Shankaracharya's moksha. Because basically, you're, you're gripping this wrong idea, and so it keeps you in the world. If you let go of it, then you will fly away free. 
Okay, let's see. Something like this. Who is doing that? So, the um, the the way he he is he is doing this teaching is that uh, it it takes the form of a dialogue. So this is very difficult to put in writing, and that's why uh, his works are very obscure because they are basically like um, a condensed form of all the discussions he had with the students. And so since in a book you cannot play the part of both uh, interlocutors in the discussion, uh, it's sometimes hard to follow because actually you have to sort of put yourself in the shoes of the person who had a completely different mental worldview from yours. Uh, And, of course, some of the assumptions of the era in which the discussions took place um, uh, of course, influence the way he writes because he's taking a lot of uh, a lot of effort, for example, to to explain away certain psychological assumptions which were current at the time, which are no longer important. So sometimes it's difficult to follow because of this. But basically, what he's trying to do is to all all the time refocus our attention to this. Right? He's basically trying to say, okay, before you do anything, you have to um, have a a correct understanding of what what it is you do when you talk. And very often, he says that when we're doing philosophy, we start already with a completely wrong view of what we do when we talk. Basically, he says philosophers are like um, people with dual personalities. When they do philosophy, they have a vision of what uh, language is, which is completely different from what they actually do when they go to the grocery shop. Philosophers are able to buy groceries, and so they are able to use language, presumably. And yet, when they talk together about philosophy, they do not speak of language the way they use it when they use it in real-world situations. So what he's trying to do is to massage our brain back into a situation in which we became, become conscious again of what we are actually doing when we are talking to other people. So, the problem in, uh, in our Indian philosophy is that it's the same problem we are facing in, uh, in our Indian philosophy. I don't know. That, uh, you that is only in uh, Western philosophy. I think so. oh, he's, he's saying only about Western philosophy. Oh, yeah. okay. Wittgenstein is clearly in the Western tradition. He doesn't know uh, Indian philosophy at all. So what he has in mind are the traditional um, uh, Western philosophers like Plato, Descartes, uh, the, the Hegel, um, um, and the logical positivists of his own time, like Bertrand Russell, for example. So he, he was in the Cambridge and he did not come to come into contact with the Indian philosophers there? At the time, people in Germany, especially he's, he's Austrian, so he, so he was he was taught in Germany. He probably had some contact with Indian thought because it was quite popular. The Upanishads had been translated in German, so he probably knew. But Nyaya philosophers, no, that no, I don't, I don't, think, I, I don't think I don't think he ever entered into the details of the different schools of Indian philosophy or anything like that. He had a very general cultural idea of what probably it was, but it, I mean, he knew Western philosophy very well. I don't think he knew... I think in those days, this much communication is also not uh, available. Because many people, people, there were uh, many people in Austria, Vienna, and uh, there were many people in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some uh, some people, but uh, they did not have so much contact, uh, day-to-day contact. At, at least, I would say, it. I mean, at the time... Hundreds of books were available. Uh, at, at the philosophy. time, the knowledge of Indian philosophy was in the Indology department, which were basically people who were philologists. They were learning Sanskrit. Ah, ah. So they knew Sanskrit and they knew ah, the text, but, but they were not philosophers. Ah, all right? Not philosophers. Many, many Nyaya books were translated. Nyaya but when, 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 yes, when, but when, these before books... Before 1931. Yes, yes, yes. But these books and were not yet read by philosophers. Ah, At the, the moment, philosophers ah. were not yet... Um, the, able to read them. They did not uh, yeah, they recognize were, they the. They were very popular in the Germany because uh, Schlegel and Schopen. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, some people, open, of course. Open humor, uh, uh, something. Uh, uh, Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer. 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 Yes, some people were influenced by it, but at the time it was considered, and it still is to a certain extent, that you cannot really understand Indian philosophy if you don't know Sanskrit. All right. 
if you read Indian philosophy in translation, it's always going to be an enormous risk of misunderstanding. So philosophers generally, if they don't know Sanskrit, they don't take the risk of saying anything about Indian philosophy because they are afraid of saying stupid things because they don't know Sanskrit. And the problem is that if you're doing a PhD in philosophy, you have already so much to learn that you don't have to learn Sanskrit in addition. You don't have time. And so because of academic specialization, the f most philosophers don't know Sanskrit, and therefore they don't dare. You know the situation for the same situation for... Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's, yeah, actually, it's, it's becoming, in fact, worse, because as uh, academic specialization increases, um, you're supposed not only to know the philosopher you're talking about, but you're also supposed to know all the publications which have been published about this philosopher, right? So it means that increasingly you're narrower and narrower because if you need to know all the publications which have been published, I mean, you, if you go to on JSTOR, you can see, you type any, any name, you will see how many millions of publications have been made. So in fact, now, it's even less likely that people who are taught in the traditional uh, philosophy in, in, the, in the West, they are less likely even to learn Sanskrit because they, they have to have this all extra knowledge about their own specialty. They don't have time. So, but um, normally the Western philosophy departments they don't teach the Indian philosophy. No, because of this, because of this Sanskrit problem, because they consider that if you don't know Sanskrit, even no. yes, they are right. I think the yeah, problem right. is they are right. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know Sanskrit, you don't really understand what is being said. If yeah, you read in translation, so only they are reading some. I asked Varun. Varun, no, plus one. He said no. It's. Um, it's so uh, total percentage around you know, three to four percent, three percent, two to three percent. So are they losing something by not studying? The yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Actually, most people in Western philosophy departments they bemoan the fact that they don't know West, uh, Indian philosophy more. But the problem is that the institutional constraints that they are in makes it impossible for them to do that. I mean, it's, it's a general problem that every uh, academic discipline has. It's called interdisciplinary. See, sir, the problem is this. Even in uh, your Sanskrit, core uh, Sanskrit universities, you are uh, leading darshanas. And how many of you know Western philosophy in the details of it? We recognize it as a philosophy, but we don't know. Have you already Similarly, seen this word? <laughs> interdisciplinarity? Interdisciplinary, right? yes. Everybody says that we should do it more, but nobody does. Right? Because, because at the moment, people in Western universities are uh, judged by the number of papers they publish. And in order to publish a paper, you have to quote all the papers which have already published in that particular field. All right? And therefore... And, uh, the problem is uh, everybody does uh, write a paper, but nobody understands the meaning. And uh, they are absolutely. all... Absolutely. Uh, so, one blind person is leading all other blind persons. Yes, so the problem with Indian philosophy is not specific about Indian philosophy, it's about this problem, because this problem exists everywhere. You have this problem in physics, you have this problem in medicine, you have this problem in history, everywhere. Everywhere people are narrowing on very, very specific uh, fields of specialty, and therefore they have less and less time to learn the other things that would be useful to their own disciplinary uh, in multidisciplinary problems. So actually, everybody says that we should do that, but at the moment, it's not happening. Actually, it's the opposite which is happening. Right? So to a certain extent, um, the Western academic tradition has condemned itself to sterility. Because if you narrow, 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 narrow your field of specialty, you're less and less and less likely to say something interesting. Why the universities are focusing on publishing more and more papers and more books? Because the problem is that in universities... Are they afraid that uh, otherwise people, uh, teachers will be inactive and... Uh, no, it's, mm. it's a problem of justice. What justice? It's a problem of justice. They, in university, the, prob the main problem is how to share the budget. In every university, you have a budget, all right? Okay. It comes from the government or it comes from donors or any, but you have some money you need to share. Mm. All right, How are, what criterion are you going to use to share the money between the different departments and inside the departments between the different researchers? You have to have objective criterion. And this 
The list of publication is the only criteria that they can use. the citations. Yes. index. Yes. So actually, For this... For the people who are working, you know? I understand everything. Working means, I, I compel you to cite money. They are paid no. a handsome no, no. salary. Money also with the... They have enough books and uh, they should work. Actually, the, the money in that case is for uh, hiring new uh, postgraduate students and for, you know, um, having Books. more... No, but especially it's, it's for grants for students because a, a department of philosophy needs to have um, quite expensive uh, um, uh, scholarships to give to its postgraduate students. Because postgraduate students, if you want to have them, you need to pay them because otherwise they will go and work uh, other, uh, elsewhere. So the, the the big budget in philosophy is uh, uh, people are not coming with interest like this. Uh, you have interest, but you need to support them. Yeah. You have to give something to them. Otherwise, only rich people can do philosophy. So the problem is that people. They have killed the whole uh, academic. In yeah, 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 yeah. To to a large extent, people don't actually accept to say that openly. But everybody knows that to a large extent, Western universities are dead. They're sterile. They don't work anymore. And in many di disciplines, it's obvious. In physics, especially, because you know narrow but fields. Still, but still, they're. Uh they are uh, claiming that uh, we have achieved this and that and due to this. No, so compared to the budget they are putting in, the achievements is, achievement is very... Yeah, yeah, that's true. But if you, if you do basically l uh, money invested, it goes like that. Achievements, like that. No, the belief, no, current belief is look, in India. Look, India, in, India. In, uh, in, in the 1930s, 50 physicists completely revolutionized physics, you know, relativity and uh, quantum mechanics. There were 30 guys in, you know, 10 universities in the world. Now, uh, there are maybe 200,000 physicists in the whole world, yes. and they're do doing basically nothing. No problem, so you see, in India, the last 30 years, the assessment is this. The government has uh, funded uh, uh, the science, hmm. scientific study. Mm -hmm. With a huge, no, you know, you can't imagine how because the uh, science uh, teachers are produced in thousands and lakhs, hmm. and uh, every student is taught in the school. Every yes. student is taught yes. science in the school. Okay? Yes. Yes. So the total number of scientists they will produce at the end of the post graduation, and the number of people we need in the science science uh, scientific institutions like ISRO, for example. Yes. ISRO. Yes. Yes. And uh, the actually, they say ISRO they is not science. I understand, but ISRO is engineering. No, no, engineering, but they need scientists. The problem is no, this. they need they engineers. Need more scientists but, but they, like, they don't uh, need scientists, they need engineers. Yes, yes but they, they, the scientists will become engineers, that is different by training. CSI but they, or something like they, ISRO, ISRO will intake, intake of ISRO is scientists. Engineers. No, I mean, no, we, both, they, they both, don't, this, both, the, 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 the idea is this. Of course, I agree. They yeah, because you know, they, when they recruit, but, you know, uh, at least they have I have, I have uh, tested, when they recruit, they don't tex, uh, recruit the people from engineering uh, B. Bachelor of yeah. they only people but with this is a, this is this is a problem which exists everywhere. No, sir, they have both uh, scientists and engineers. Engineers, engineers. Yeah, but I mean, this is a problem that you find yeah. everywhere. Science is prestigious, engineering is not. Yes. All right. Whereas, in fact, what you need is engineers. You don't need scientists. Yeah. Right? For working, working, working but for the problem is that for social reasons, mm -hmm. you have to call them scientists, even yeah. though they're not. <laughs> it's a lie. It's a social lie. Yes. <laughs> like like so many things, you know. You are right. In our uh, Pondicherry French Institute, yeah, they are all calling. Uh, we are hiring a new Indology scientist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Indology was for science and science. All Pondicherry. All Pondicherry. It's it's very clear. I mean, uh, uh, in the past, in in the past, people used to be more honest. You know, in, in the nineteen in the nineteen thirties, uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, Albert Einstein. Was called a scientist, and he is right. 
and uh, um, Werner von Braun. You know who Werner von Braun is? He's the guy who, who made all the rockets for the Nazis and then did all the, the rockets for the Americans. You know, the, the moon he, projects. He, he migrated to America? Yes, actually he was, he, he was, uh, he was captured and at the end of the war by the Americans, brought to America. Eventually he became an American citizen and he went on to be the, the leader of the American space project to the moon. So this, this guy is very famous for basically engineering the rockets so which went to the moon. Yes, yes, it's engineering part, yeah. Sorry? To send the, this one, satellite to the moon is an engineering project. Yeah, and he, all his life, he called himself an engineer. Yes, yes, he's right, we can understand. Right? So, but the problem is that for... Our uh, Abdul Kalam was called a scientist. scientific For, for this, this reason, science. these people are like magicians. Because the problem is that we are still Platonists. We still believe that the scientists, they have access to this hidden thing. Yeah, it's always the same problem. <laughs> They're abstract, they can work with abstract things. Basically, they can look into the mind of God. Right? And so these guys are like magicians, where these guys are just like shopkeepers or, you know, artisans. Yeah, still we have in that mind, very clearly. Yes. And this is the reason why Isro hires scientists, even though they need engineers. And this is the reason why Isro sometimes their rockets blow, 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 blow up. No, that is not the reason. It's Rockets blow in even in America. And in America China. also, this is the reason why the space shuttle blew up. Because if you hire scientists to do engineers work, it will blow up. They blow up. Yeah. But in India we have good engineers. Yes, in, in America too. I mean, until the 1970s, people called themselves engineers, they did rocket. Right? After the 1980s, people starting to have, you know, this crazy thing about science and they wanted scientists to make rockets and they made the space shuttle. It's the costliest and most dangerous spaceship ever made. <laughs> it's true. The scientists made it yes, yeah, yeah, instead yeah, of engineers. Yeah. At that time already people were starting to think that oh this is science. Werner von Braun was not a scientist. He was you know very careful like making his rocket a little bit extra strong just in case. This kind of thing. He was not at all doing all calculations or anything. This was really trial and error. And uh, you can see that how the culture inside NASA changed. Because. The sociology of NASA is very, very interesting because you can see how the culture changed between. No, no, no NASA uh, recruits uh, engineers. NASA is dead. They don't do anything. They haven't been able to launch a rocket Compared for the past to 30 years. 300 billion. They're not doing anything in NASA. They did not launch. No. Okay. Now, what when they mean? when they send astronauts to the space station, their they own space the, station, they, they have the to Russian, use the Russian rocket. Russian ISS and the... Because the Russian rocket is still made by engineers. People who wear, you know, blue things and have screwdrivers and when it doesn't work, they just, you know, fix it. Yes, that's it. Yeah, it's like that. When people go pragmatic, to Russia... Pragmatic, they have pragmatic ideas. It's what an engineer is. An engineer is not supposed to know why it works. He has to make it work. That's all. Whereas, whereas a scientist will, will waste time how it works trying to understand why it works. And it's not the problem. If, you, if it works, don't fix it. And this is, this is very well known. It's, it's a very, very, you know, well described. I mean, traditionally, this, this kind of problem is very well known, but still... But in India, we, we, we project them as scientists all these years have projected as yeah, because of, because, Abdul because Kalam, of this. the last president was uh, because of this. known to be a we are still platonists scientists. we are still platonists in fact basically wittgenstein failed he he didn't his project was to cure western culture of this illusion and he is recognized for this as the most important philosopher of the 20th century then what was the impact of wittgenstein's uh, project basically the impact was a big statue of Wittgenstein. <laughs> and then 
he was forgotten. Today, his influence in Western philosophy is... Uh, Even in the Department of Western Philosophy? I was very surprised. I, I, um, I, I did a sort of uh, um, sabbatical year in uh, 2005 in Cambridge. And so I had discovered Wittgenstein before, and I thought that, okay, I'm going to Cambridge, I'm going to see Wittgenstein everywhere, because it's the place where he taught. And actually, Wittgenstein in Cambridge now is a few pictures on the wall in the library. Okay. And that's it. So his books are kept somewhere? Yeah, yeah, of course. Everybody knows about Wittgenstein. He is very famous. But actually, nobody understands what he did. Basically, the problem is that this, this superstition is still at the heart of Western culture. And so people are attracted by it like moths to a flame. They cannot help but wanting to be there. And this, this problem is just one of the practical consequences. When he says, you know, it's, it's an illness, he's, he's right. Rockets explode because of this illness. When he says it's a mental illness, when you look at NASA, you can say they are crazy. That's why Russian rockets are, uh, they are not exploding. Because they cannot afford it. They are protected by their poverty. Basically, since they cannot afford to have armies of scientists running around, they have to rely on practitioners. And as a result, it works. It's not because they are, you know, more clear about all this. It's just because by chance, they are poor, and they are still using basically a rocket which was designed in the 1950s. The reason why it works is because it was designed by a guy who was out of a gulag in the 19 out of a gulag, uh, Sergei Korolev, the the designer of the Russian rockets which are still flying now, was a guy who had been in the gulag, you know, because of the purges in Stalin's time. Gulag. Gulag, you know the, the concentration camp in, uh, in Russia, in communist Russia. Because basically everybody who had a degree was potentially a traitor. So everybody who had a, a degree was in the Gulag during the war. During, you know, Stalin was really crazy. So he was so afraid, so paranoid, that everybody who had, had education, he was afraid. And so he put lots and lots of people in concentration camps. And so this, this designer... Um, for five or ten years lived in a concentration camp. And then he was released after the war because the Russians now needed rockets because they, they saw that the Americans were making rockets because of the, the German scientists they had taken. And so these guys had very rudimentary education. They were not scientists at all. And, and they said, okay, now you're going to make a rocket or you will be shot. Oh, there, there's no other option for them. Uh, yeah, and so they make a very, very safe, simple rocket, which will work. <laughs> <laughs> and it still works, and it's still sending uh, guys so, to the space so the, station. SIDAC uh, in India was uh, established for, the, for creating the supercomputer. After that, last 20 years, they are not doing anything. No work. Yes, yes, yes. They are, they are dead. And <laughs> ISRO will happen one day, after 10 years ISRO will happen. No, 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 ISRO because will not happen. No, because, because, because the uh, CDAC produced only one supercomputer and it did nothing. Mm. But uh, uh, nobody in India depends upon the CDAC. <laughs> but the whole of India depends upon the ISRO, so they have to deliver something. They will be launching rockets again and again. And, uh, uh, the 90% of their rockets are uh, successful. Yeah. Actually, PSLV works very well, but the other one, not so well. GSLV, they have not yet mastered the technology. So it may take some more time. I mean, it will work. Eventually, if you put enough money, anything will work. But it's not cost effective. Basically, if you put scientists in charge of something, it will cost 100 times the money if you, compared to if you give it to engineers. Because the scientists will will try to figure out everything in advance. They will make all sorts of hypothesis calculations and everything. And in the end, what they will produce will be much too complicated. They will produce more papers than... Uh... For example, in a, in, let's, let's say you're building a rocket, you have vibration problems. The scientists will do a theory of vibration from, this, from scratch to describe the vibration problem. Engineer will do what? He will just increase the, 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 the width 
of the outside skin of the rocket, maybe by half a millimeter, and it will do it. He doesn't know why, but he knows that probably if he increases the width of the skin of the rocket, the vibrations will go away. <laughs> Actually, what is terrible, but what is terrible is that this kind of jokes exist in every culture. Yes. All right. Everybody knows that, and still, the the magical attraction of this is so strong. Yes. That even yes. though people know because of this kind of jokes that it will not work, they will still hire scientists. Yes. Because this is like religion. It's it's something which people believe in in a superstitious manner. It's it's not based on experience. It's not based on um, reason. It's it's based so on some kind of uh, yes. maybe even due to fear failure. factor. Maybe even due to fear factor of failure. See, in, even in our shastras, maybe. even in our tradition, we believe in these pundits. Who do all these exercises? Okay, but the reality is only only the good person who does not have any education can reach moksha. But still, people have attraction to this. No, no, no. I don't. No, accept. I accept this. So we did. Either same same things will happen because you are in this realm. You you can't accept. No, 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 no. But reality is that the common, uh, man, cannot, 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 common man cannot go to the moksha yeah, unless he is. Very deeply involved in the common man in the sense, sense, man man in the sense, sense a good who has who has ah. lot of spiritual realization, ah. nothing to do with your ghatapata vakya. Ah. That's, 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 that's all I mean. That's all I mean. Sir, a person with realization, simple ajji hokta dre mukhya ke santosh ajji na. Allah, I mean spiritual realization. Sir, our entire do sense. How do you think? Ni yado vando super te karte na to ghatapata vakya. Deka gila. Deka gila. That's all. Still, still that is the reaction. No, 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 no. Still, there is a reaction. See, there are two different. Uh, there See, are two in different our, in our tradition, parts. spirituality is very simple. Mm -hmm. People can, spiritual can, people, a spiritual person can go to the moksha. Mm -hmm. But still, there is an attraction But, towards this classical understanding of, you know, uh, adhyatma and uh, this. Sir, don't mistake it. Don't mistake it. People don't have attraction. It. People have attraction. I don't no, know. People have attraction. People have attraction. I'm not an expert, but I, I think from what I know that what you're saying is that. Even though there are many paths to moksha, mm. people tend to think that the only valid path is jnana yoga. Mm. Is that what you're trying yes. to say? Uh, more or less. More, more or less. less. And and it's true. In the West, it's the same. There's no idea of moksha, but this <laughs> is the. You are not Brahmin. Tell me now. People are Brahmin. People are not Brahmin. Yes. Basically, the equivalent of jnana yoga in the Western tradition is called gnosticism. ಗ್ನಾಸ್ಟಿಸಿಸಮ್ಸ್ಟಿಸಿಸಮ್ಸ್ಟಿಸಿಸಮ್ಸ್ಟಿಸಿಸಮ್ಸ್ಟಿಸ
and eventually the position which won inside Christianity is that you can only be saved by faith. And Gnosticism was considered a heresy. It was basically banned after a while. But initially, in the early centuries of Christianity, when Christianity was not an organized religion, but it was small groups of people who had various positions, depending on the schools they belonged to, basically Gnosticism was a form of Christianity, so it considered Christ to be an important person, etc., but more a teacher who is going to give you knowledge and not someone in whom you're supposed to have faith. There, there were really clearly two very different positions based one on faith and the other one on knowledge. And as a result, Gnosticism was marginalized. It but never it completely disappeared, but it was. Christianity. Yeah. Christianity took, let's say, 99% of the space and um, some small Gnostic groups remained clandestine for the whole Middle Ages, basically. It never disappeared completely, but it was suppressed. All right? And to a certain extent, what we can say it, is that this is a return of Gnosticism. And it is strange, but to a certain extent, Wittgenstein is saying the same as Christianity. He's saying that this is wrong. If you believe that knowledge is going to help you do the work, basically, it will not, it will fail. And that's why your rocket I will... I Actually, what I mean, what we did today yeah. is to establish a case that Wittgenstein is not an idle thinker, because what we what we basically said, I, I think, is that the reason why rockets explode if you use scientists is what Wittgenstein is talking about. Yes. So yes. it has very practical consequences. Basically, even though it seems that what he's saying is very esoteric, in fact, you can see the consequences of what he's saying in real life uh, events, in real life uh, things. I mean, like rockets, but also in uh, computer projects. Yes. Basically, the, this idea that we are bewitched by something seems to be true. Because why would we put huge amounts of money in things that will explode. Okay. If we're not, we'd be which That's exactly the behavior of a so which person. So do you think that, uh, that the, whole, the only practical uh, experience is enough to handle the situation rather than having the scientific ideas? And, uh, no, actually, the, the problem of Wittgenstein is that, to a certain extent, his work, I think, is unfinished. Because um, he, he was able to sort of dispel this illusion, but what he did is entirely negative. Basically, even though he's not never saying this, he is basically destroying the meaning of knowledge and truth. After Wittgenstein, in Western culture, knowledge and truth should no longer be used, because he has basically destroyed the usual meaning that we attach to these words. After Wittgenstein, we should never use the word knowledge and truth in a sentence. Absolute truth and absolute knowledge. Because the problem is that in our language, truth has become absolute truth. And knowledge has become absolute knowledge. The, 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 these words have been sort of attracted by Platonism, and Platonism has sort of captured them. And so the, the, the meaning that we attach to truth and knowledge is the meaning Platonism attached to these words. So if we, if we actually followed Wittgenstein, we could no longer use these words because these words have been irretrievably burdened by Platonic uh, illusion, all right? Well, he calls illusion. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah not he idea. says illusion, right? So uh, since these are illusions, we should not use these words because they induce illusions in us. And this is the result, right? We have illusion about science, and as a result, the space shuttle explodes. It's a classic example of the consequence of illusion. If you have illusions, you will die. Okay, because if you have an illusion that there is a road and in fact there is a hole, you will fall in the hole, you will die. So illusion 
leads to death. So don't calculate and uh, walk. So on your experience, you just walk. No, what I'm saying is that Vivian Shain never said what you should replace these words with. That's oh. the problem. Because he died before or he thought that his part of the work was done and someone else had to provide the rest of the answer. The problem is that he said basically the word knowledge and the word but truth. But nobody continued his work? No. Because people hated this. They wanted to go back there. And so this is what they did. Basically, Western philosophy since Wittgenstein has been this. And Wittgenstein is still hailed as a great philosopher. Why? Because people are sufficiently intelligent still to understand that what he did was probably um, impossible to refute. I mean, his, his way of doing things is so strong that you cannot, you, you are, you're forced to accept that he's right, right? When you listen to him, when you read his books, you are sort of carried by the force of his argument to accept, yeah, yeah, it, it's true. But then, when you close the book and start doing something else, your vice will come back.